you know, this is not going to be an anti-surgery podcast. It's about an understanding the limits and maybe understanding that they might be a little bit further along than you think when it comes to actual physical rehabilitation and injury. Because exercise programming, you know, there's so much in the social media sphere right now about technique and execution, which I think is great. But on, you know, uh, when it comes to rehabilitation and injuries, exercise programming is the fundamental principle of biomechanics that we need to really pay attention to because there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, load management and you know allocating stress to particular tissues and full range of motion and all this which is great but picking the right exercise is going to be the tool especially when we're dealing with acute injuries so i kind of wanted to lend some insight on like all right we are going to discuss how to program for pain management is sort of like a step-by-step -step process. So if someone comes to you just off the gym floor and we'll go general injury, what are kind of your stages that you walk through with this person to bring them back to full function? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it all starts with understanding the symptoms, um, especially if it's something that it's more fresh, you haven't had imaging on. Imaging is, imaging is always more information. It's not always necessary though. So if it's someone like high stakes, like, we're talking NFL combine, like, yeah, you better get some imaging done just so you have all the information that you need. But a lot of people that's, you know, maybe they don't want to do it. Maybe it's not realistic. Maybe it's not convenient. They want to try going the conservative route. Um, so the thing that has been most helpful for me right out of the gate is understanding the symptoms. Um, so it's always going to start like history taking. I want to know exactly how the injury happened. I want to know the onset of pain is, did, is it something that crept in slowly? Is it something that happened suddenly? Was it an acute injury? Um, is it something that hurts worse in a particular movement or at a particular time of day? And all of these things give you information into the actual structures or uh, the mechanism of the actual injury, what you're dealing with in terms of rehab. Aside from that, um, really understanding the pain pattern that they're having. So it's the questions are always, what makes it feel better? what makes it feel worse? And then are there things that you do that, that don't necessarily affect how it's feeling? So that's all information that tells you, okay, like uh, if we talk active versus passive range of motion, that's one thing that we can use to start to rule in or rule out specific structures that might be injured. So if we're talking a muscular injury, that's something that's probably going to be worse on um, a more active range of motion, something where they're contracting that muscle versus something that gives them pain or discomfort on passive, it, it might be a passive joint structure, something more ligamentous, joint capsule, inflammatory, that sort of thing. Um, so for me, it always under it always starts with understanding what you're actually dealing with. And if you have some sort of working understanding of what these injuries are or how you've been able to manage them in the past, then you want to overlay those two things. And it, it that gives you at least a starting point. So if we're talking something with, that we want to work short-term rehab, we're trying to get progress out of this person relatively quickly. Um, it's it's definitely understanding that and then letting that be the the bounds on your programming decisions. There's there's going to be certain things that always make it feel worse. They're going to aggravate the symptoms. And a lot of times they're going to be things that are consistent with the mechanism of injury, right? If, if they had, um, I don't know, uh, let's let's say a, a quad tear, a quad tendon tear, something I'm very, very familiar with. All right. They're probably going to have a hard time eccentrically loading that quad, getting into deep knee flexion, things that are going to put a lot of stress on that quad tendon. So that's something that we're probably going to avoid loading uh, in that short term. And we're going to find things that we can do that will stabilize them through that range of motion while taking stress off of that injured tissue. So a, a pattern that I like to go through um, I typically, when I'm working with people that have injuries that are on the more acute side, and this, this kind of falls with chronic too, but um, I'll, I'll start with more isometric or more static movements and get them in positions. And that gives them an opportunity to learn how to coordinate stability in those positions. Like one that, uh, or two that I've been really leaning into for the lower body lately are uh, just an isometric lunge hold. And I did this last week a lot when we were in Tampa is like a staggered stance RDL, but just a static hold in that hinge position in, in the, the greatest degree of hip flexion that we can get them in. And what that does is it allows them time to understand how to stabilize the lumbar spine, how to stabilize the hip joint itself, and then learn how to build awareness around foot pressure, which is they're the things that I look towards to, to being effective in creating and expressing force through the lower body. So it's, it's really in my mind, 
understanding the things that are going to flare up the injury, making sure that, that we're avoiding that, we're keeping those out of there, having something in that is going to be low risk to get them to build awareness around positions that are going to be safe and start to stabilize positions that will be able to load over time. And the progression from there is I want to start static, build a really good understanding of how to create stability in the less stable portion of the range of motion. And then it starts to go to dynamic through a range of motion that's not necessarily going to complicate or worsen any symptoms that they're having. And then the progression back towards activity, it's, it's, for me, it's always going to be volume first. So we want to build up endurance in these positions, their capacity to hold these positions uh, independent of, of load. And then after that, once they have an acceptable amount of endurance or ability to move in and out of these positions, um, sorry, before that's going to be range of motion. So the, th those two, I kind of, I blur the lines on depending on symptoms. Uh, so range of motion and volume, we want to move them we want to increase their endurance, but we also want to increase the range of motion. So that's like, those are the two that will limit uh, their loading progression in my mind. So unless we can get as much or full range of motion out of the movement and we can build a reasonable amount of endurance in those positions, then I'm not going to introduce load because we can still have a lot of progress on those things while keeping it relatively low stress. And once you get them to the point where moving through full range of motion, no increase in symptoms. Um, there's a reasonable amount of endurance to hold those positions through increasing volume. Then it's going to be starting to increase load, going through some sort of loading progression, and then getting them back into um, like like adding speed to the movement, making it more dynamic, change of direction, that sort of thing. Um, what I've seen, especially working like with a more athletic population, injuries that are going to happen in the gym are going to happen when someone doesn't have the capacity to manage eccentric load. So that's something that I think the isometrics become really important in is because it puts them in a position where they're starting to build their capacity to manage eccentric load, to stabilize these joints in positions that might be less stable so that as we start to get back to increasing loading and increasing speed in the movements, they now understand or they have a layer of awareness of how they need to coordinate those movements so that they can stay safe in those positions. So that's kind of like a, that's a pretty general overview. Um, we can expand on any of those things, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it back to you to kind of yeah. see what your thoughts on it. I think one of the things that really helps out of the gate in undergoing the process of programming post pain or post injury is instilling this idea and it can be difficult at in the start, but getting very confident with instilling the idea that the goal isn't perfection, mm -hmm. that the goal is just sucking less. And that really, and this is, it's a, it's a kind of a, like a negative compliment. It's like, oh, you thought you were functioning at a hundred percent. Like, no, like you were at 51% and now you're at some threshold below 50%. These are all arbitrary numbers, of course, just to kind of illuminate the point. But it's like the goal is just to get to you back to 51%. And then once you're out of pain, we can really start to, to, to push the needle, right? So I think people think that 99% is where pain exists. And that 100% and optimal is where you're going to see all of the benefit, where you're going to be pain-free. It's like, or sorry, 100% is pain-free. And then 99% is where everything falls apart. It's like, no, most people are not you know, accurately assessing uh, you know, f for their load management and exercise programming. They're not in a more microcosm. They're not accurately assessing for, you know, load management and technique and execution on particular tissues, right? Are you loading more uh, inert soft tissues rather than muscles when you're performing these movements? Does the aggregation of these ill-performed, ill-prescribed movements start to, to collect to some sort of tipping point where you now start to feel pain? So I think instilling that out of the gate. So someone comes to you like, I, you know, I have an injury, whether it's a herniated disc, whether it's an ACL tear, whether it's whatever, and you can just go, okay, like the goal is 51%, right? Now, so that's, I think, a really good benchmark to establish is that we don't need a lot of progress to get you out of pain because you were operating pain-free for a long time and you weren't operating anywhere near 100%. This is where getting information about how they used to move. Now, this is works better if you've dealt with the athlete or person prior to and they've come and they've become injured. That way you can be like, look, 
you kind of have a tendency. We know your lacks of range of motion. We still have things to work on. So having some sort of retrospective data on movement quality, I think is really useful, whether it's by way of like old lifting videos, whether it's by way of you know you coaching in the past. Hopefully if you're coaching them, you're, you're paying attention to these things that matter. They're not getting injured as much. We're mitigating that risk. Um, and we know how to downregulate when symptoms become present. But getting retrospective data, I think, is super useful in the selling point of like, look, this is dog shit. Like, you're lucky you didn't hurt yourself before. And it's like, oh, okay. Because I think that instills some hope of like, oh, I don't need to return back to 100% because I was never there to begin with. I'd be so happy to get back to where I was before. And then when you set the mile marker there in the initial stage, like, dude, we can get you back to where you were before, but we can actually get you better by paying attention to these other movement qualities that you don't seem to possess given the retroactive footage that we have of you moving or assessing the non-injured side, right? Like here, we're going to assess the non-injured side. So your dog shit over here. Oh, this, then this is your dominant leg or arm or whatever. There's no way you had this movement quality present in your injured side.